I came here on a ship called the Ascania in 1962 from Trinidad and Tobago. And for the first time in my life, I was adrift on a sea of circumstance, having to take care of my own self. And that was a rough time for me. I had to face certain realities. And some of those were in housing. You know, the ads in the shop windows still said, no Irish, no blacks, no dogs. I think uh, laws that outlaw discrimination in public places were very important. And they came about because of the challenges that we faced as immigrants and the response that we had. You come to a place where you're looking for a house or a room to rent, it has been advertised. And the person says, why not try that other place around the corner? My other tenants might object. Very sorry, uh, it's just gone, or something like that. When you hear that three or four or five times, you begin to think, no, it's not just gone. You don't want me to stay on those premises, but you're afraid to say that. So there were all these excuses that allowed racism, uh, covert racism, to go on unchallenged, once that legislation was in place, people found it a lot harder to do what they had been doing before. I think it still went on to some degree because laws don't change the minds of the people, not immediately anyway. But when there is uh, legislation in place, people think twice and they begin to think, am I wrong? Am I doing wrong? Are these people really, are their rights being violated? Can I do something different? I have to think differently, otherwise I'll fall foul of the law. So I think that legislation changed things positively for the better. Welcome. A good union presents the United Kingdom African and African Caribbean Community Directory. A documentary series to promote good values and traditions. The series begins with a UK overview of key areas of focus. The six areas are 1. Anti-African racism, 2. Interfaith, 3. Spiritual freedom and religious license. 4. Education. 5. Connections between UK Africans, African Caribbean, and Africa. And 2. 6. Explore ideas around international human rights advocacy and collaboration. Welcome. Thank you for joining. A Good Union United Kingdom Directory. Promotes African, African Caribbean groups, indexes, networks, forums, organizations, and communities. We want to promote your organization and any event activities coming up. If you want to publish a short article on our platforms and include it in the community directory, please email equality at blackmajor.onmicrosoft.com. Ask via WhatsApp question or join a Good Union United Kingdom LinkedIn directory and ask the administrator. Most importantly, we want to share your values that reflect the needs and wants of the UK African and African Caribbean communities. Feel free to recommend local charitable organizations, people or causes. Help us recognize, promote, and celebrate volunteers and professionals doing amazing work at your location for Africans and African Caribbeans. Help us create a press release that shows the community what is important to you and the good things you or your community are about. Please feel free to send photographs and promotional material. And do not hesitate to contact us if you have any queries. Thank you for your support and work. We look forward to promoting us. A Good Union United Kingdom. Connecting values to amplify black voices. Order, order. It's a bit loud. Uh, before we begin, can I encourage members to wear masks when they're not speaking? 
This is in line with the current government guidance and that of the House of Commons Commission. Uh, please also give each other and members of staff space when seated and when entering and leaving the room. Elliot Colburn to move the motion. Thank you, Mr Hosey, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And can I thank all honourable and right honourable members for expressing an interest in this afternoon's petitions committee debate. I beg to move that this House has considered e-petition 300105, entitled Introduce Mandatory Ethnicity Pay Gap Reporting. If I could begin with a prayer of this petition, which states, and I quote, much like the existing mandatory requirements for employers with 250 or more employees must publish their gender pay gap, we call upon the government to introduce the ethnicity pay gap reporting to shine a light on race and ethnic based inequality in the workplace so that they can be addressed. Currently, there is a lack of available data engaging the ethnicity pay gap in the workplace. Introducing these measures will allow employers to be held accountable in closing the gap where there is a disparity. In order to achieve a fairer workplace, publishing this data is one of the, is one of the next steps to knowing how extensive the issues are um, from a race and ethnicity perspective and not just through the lens of gender. This petition closed with 130,567 signatures, including 355 from my own Carshalton and Wallington constituency. And in advance of today's debate, I would like to thank the petition creator for taking the time to talk to me about why they started this petition, but also organisations like NatWest, Lloyds and Barclays, who took the time to speak to me about their experience of ethnicity pay gap reporting in their own organisations. And I'll go on to talk about this a little bit later. Uh, I would also like to thank the independent statistician Nigel Marriott for his very helpful briefing note and his thoughts, which members can view on his website. Now, Mr Hosey, there has been many calls in support of an, of an ethnicity pay gap uh, reporting um, and this request is not something new or born out of this petition. It's been, uh, it's been around for some time. Uh, and even the uh, April 2021 Commission on Eth Race and Ethnic Disparities also found that pay gap reporting is a potentially useful tool. But if we go back to 2018, when my right honourable friend, the member for Maidenhead, was Prime Minister, uh, she launched a consultation on this issue. Uh, and the, aim, the stated aim of the, uh, of the consultation at that time was with, the, uh, was with the aim of helping employers identify barriers and enable a fairer and more diverse workplace, a move at the time that was welcomed by both the CBI and the Equality and Human Rights Commission, along with businesses, charities, academics and beyond. Now, all of these, including the petition creator and those who briefed me prior to today's debate, made the case that ethnicity pay gap reporting, much like gender pay gap reporting, could help businesses understand their workforce better, identify barriers to equality and create action plans to tackle those barriers. And, of course, it would help inform government as to the reality of pay gaps and consider the action they can take if needed. Now, I'm sure colleagues from across the House will go into greater detail about the benefits of pay cap reporting um, throughout their contributions, so I won't steal everyone's material in my opening speech. But I would just like to draw uh, attention to an example of an existing system of pay gap reporting in the UK, which of course relates to gender. In a, in a blog published by the LSE in March this year, it was found that gender pay gap reporting has indeed been effective in, in its aim of narrowing the gap. The difference between men and women's pay has shrunk by just under a fifth during this time. Uh, and it has affected employers due to the fact, according to the blog, that female workers show a strong aversion to um, employers that have high uh, pay gap reporting, suggesting that organisations have felt compelled to make changes in order to attract and retrain workers. So one would hope that this would be the same within the case of ethnicity pay gaps. And indeed, speaking to some of these organisations, uh, such as the three large banks that I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, it is very clear from talking to them that this has taught their businesses a lot and it has in helped inform their action plans to create more equal workplaces. Uh, however, as the government did identify in their response to this petition, it is true that there are some complications to this reporting that will need to be overcome before proposals can be brought forward. Now, these have been explained, at, uh, very ably explained by Nigel Marriott in his briefing note, um, and I do just want to touch on a few of them here. And I must stress that these are not arguments against ethnicity pay gap reporting, but just an identification of what the government will have to consider before bringing forward any proposals. The first thing to mention is that whilst um, it may seem, the, whilst it might seem easy to go straight to gender pay gap reporting as the 
as the kind of the word I'm looking for, Mr. Hosey, is template. Uh, this template that I'm looking for, thank you very much for being patient with me, um, for ethnicity pay gap reporting. It's not just uh, as simple as being able to replicate that for a number of reasons. Now, gender pay gap reporting is supported by the fact that it's largely binary, although not exclusively, but given how big that discussion is, I think we'll save that for another day. Um, but it, and it's more or less evenly distributed across the country, whereas ethnicity breakdown in the population can alter drastically depending on where you are and can fall into a much larger number of, cate a much larger number of categories. And this then presents a number of data protection issues because, of course, data of this kind must never reveal inadvertently the identity of the person that it's supposed to be reporting about. So, for example, a small business in a predominantly white um, uh, community could inadvertently be revealing information about employees' pay when it, um, uh, for just one of their employees, for example. And then there is the difficulty of how you disaggregate this data in the first place, i.e. what categories or descriptions do you use, and how do you truly reflect your employees' wishes and how they prefer to be identified. Finally, this is made all the more difficult when you consider the issue of disclosure, where it's estimated something between 5 and 40% of employees do not disclose their ethnicity. Now again, these are not arguments against ethnicity pay gap reporting, it's just important to raise them here and consider how we overcome them in order to bring forward proposals. It may be that we look only to businesses over a certain number of employees or report on an industry level rather than an individual employer level, for example. But if I could perhaps suggest to the Minister, as he and I are both London MPs, uh, I would suggest that London is the perfect place to trial such a scheme before rolling it out uh, countrywide. Either way, I do hope that the government is considering this carefully. I note from their written response that they are looking to publish their analysis of the 2018 consultation later this year. So any further information as to the date of that publication and, and any plans to bring forward such proposals would be very welcome indeed. But I will end my remarks there, Mr Hosey, and hand over to the rest of my colleagues. The question is, this House has considered e-petition 300105 relating to ethnicity pay gap reporting. Stephen Bonner. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, Mr. Hosey, and uh, it's also a pleasure to call the member for Kilshalton and Warrington. It saddens me to say that structural racism still pervades and permeates our society today. Over decades, progress has been too slow in addressing racial inequalities. We are continuing to see the impacts of this and inequality in the jobs market, particularly towards those groups from minority communities. It should shame all of us to know that ethnic minorities in the UK are less likely to find career-type sustainable work than their white counterparts, even when born and educated right here in the very same United Kingdom. While we know that ethnic discrimination in hiring is pervasive and enduring, it is not clear just how much of the labour market disadvantage experienced by ethnic minorities can be attributed to employer discrimination. Overall, just two-thirds of black, Asian, minority ethnic people are in work in the UK, which equates to 68 per cent, compared with nearly four-fifths or 78 per cent of their white counterparts. Once fortunate enough to be in work, black, Asian and minority ethnic people are also more likely to be in lower paid employment than their white counterparts. This, in large, reflects long-standing occupational segregation and often intersects with other characteristics such as gender and class. People from minority ethnic groups are overrepresented in a range of lower paying jobs such as care workers, security, hospitality, customer services and taxi drivers. Racial inequality in the labour market has persisted for decades. We all must play a part in addressing it, especially those of us in government, and this government can do more. For an example of the employment inequality divide, we, like, we need to look no further than right here in this city of London. The uh, data gathered by the ONS shows that the minority ethnic employees in the capital earn 24 per cent less than their white counterparts. 24 per cent less, Mr Chairman, a quite shocking statistic in the 21st century in which we are to believe we live in an equal society. This is a statistic which will not only continue to increase without swift action by this government, we must introduce a mandatory reporting requirement modelled on the 2017 Gender Pay Disclosure. 
This will be one of the most transformative steps a company can take to address racial inequality at work and to overcome practical difficulties in the workplace. We have a government with a very large majority that has indicated the desire of, quote, building a fairer economy, ensuring the UK's organisations reflect the nation's diversity and equality. Why then, I must ask, is it taking so painfully long for this government to consulate a report that has been commissioned since 2018, more than two years after it released its consultations on the plans? No further developments have materialised. In Scotland, on the other hand, we have made great progress. In March 2020, a commitment was given by the Scottish Government to implement the key findings of the Scottish Parliament's Equalities and Human Rights Committee. And in doing so, the Scottish Government will take responsibility to assess the prevalence of institutional racism and proactively challenge and change practices that disadvantage minority ethnic communities and, more importantly, ensure these communities are involved in shaping this change. The Scottish Government, of course, recognise that taking these recommendations by no way represents a final step, Mr Chair, but it is a step in the right direction, and it is a step more than has been taken by this UK Government, and it is a step more than they seem willing to take. Pressure is now increasing on the Government, and an agenda for change had already been set out in 2018 by the independent McGregor Smith Review on Race Relations in the Workplace. The report showed a lack of access to training and promotion opportunities for black and ethnic minority employees. It also showed low numbers of top-paid black and minority ethnic employees and high proportions of black and minority ethnic people in poorly paid jobs. Currently, there is a lack of data available to us to gauge the ethnicity pay gap in the workplace. Introducing these measures will allow employers to be held accountable in closing the gap where there is disparity. To achieve a fairer workplace, I wish of us all, publishing this data is one of the next steps to know how extensive the issues are from a race and ethnicity perspective and not just through the lens of gender. The Prime Minister has already faced criticism for saying, and I quote, what I want to do as Prime Minister changes the narrative so we stop the sense of victimisation and discrimination. Well, perhaps if he had paid attention to the tragic and brutal killings of George Floyd, which led to widespread outrage and protests across the globe, he would realise governments are now facing more pressure, increased pressure, to remove societal injustice faced by blacks, Asians, minority ethnic communities. Just like I advocated back here in October of last year on the issue of gender pay gap reporting, I am now asking again the same of this government to deliver what they have already promised in their 2017 manifesto and implement compulsory ethnicity pay monitoring. Thank you, Chair. My honourable friend, the member for Cushalton and Walling. A good union United Kingdom directory and documentary disclaimer. Fair use copyright disclaimer under section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. A collective cry for change that gripped the world and filled the streets last summer. But was anyone listening? In the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement, the government put together a commission to look into racial inequality in Britain. Today, they released their findings, claiming that far from having a problem, the UK is a world leader when it comes to eradicating racism. There are disparities. The interesting thing about this report is that it doesn't find those um, disparities landing in racism. It actually finds them in, in a lot of other things. The report found no evidence of institutional racism, that inequalities are more likely to be caused by geography, poverty and culture than race, and that ethnic minorities are haunted by historic racism that doesn't exist anymore in modern Britain. I assume you've had people come to you during this process who've said to you that they feel that their lived experience is one of institutional racism. Clearly you don't believe them, are they lying? Are they deluded? At the moment, people are just going around declaring institutional racism. I, I, recently, 
somebody has just cleared that the whole education system is institutionally racism, racist. And, 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 and what they've done, they've devalued the term. We look suspicious. Figures show that black people are nine times more likely than white people to be stopped and searched by the police. Dr Sewell says that's not due to racism, but to high levels of crime within the black community itself. We need to go back and look at issues around how they've been brought up, what's the socioeconomic issues around them, family strain, some of the mistrust, some of the um, issues around masculinity, which have nothing to do with racism because it's black men killing each other. Simon Woolley is a former government advisor on race. I find some of the language used by this report appalling. Uh, you know, the idea that it's in, our, it's in our heads, this historical legacy that doesn't allow us to move forward denies the lived experience of being stopped and searched 10 times more likely than other people. After last year's protests, the Commission says it wants to see a major shift in the race debate that even appears to include rewriting the narrative on slavery. The report states, there is a new story about the Caribbean experience which speaks to the slave period not only being about profit and suffering but how culturally African people transformed themselves into a remodelled African Britain. It's all very different from the tone taken just a few years ago under Theresa May when she promised to tackle Britain's burning injustices. If you're black, you're treated more harshly by the criminal justice system than if you're white. Now number 10 is engaged in what insiders have described as a war on wokeness, spearheaded by policy chief Manira Mirza, who has questioned whether structural racism even exists, as has the Equalities Minister, who was questioned today over whether the Commission is genuinely independent. All but one uh, were from an ethnic minority background, ranging, ranging from West African to Pakistani. They were very much independent, but the Prime Minister did ask for the report. He commissioned, he commissioned it. Lovely place, lovely day. But is this all a bit awkward for Labour? Many have painted Keir Starmer as being weak in his response on race, suggesting he's torn between the Labour left and white working class voters. Of course, we all acknowledge the steps and the progress that have made, has been made, and that is a good thing, but there's a long way to go yet, and I don't think this is the time to sit back uh, and say, job done. Young protesters were characterised in the report as well-meaning idealists who see institutional racism even when it isn't there, something that these pupils would dispute. Today, they walked out of lessons alleging that this school in Westminster has banned afros and colourful hijabs. We're doing a peaceful protest. We told everyone, just sit down and don't listen anymore. Like, we had enough. We need a change. The school said in a statement, it is with regret that these matters have come to a head in such a public way and they are working hard to resolve the issues raised. The Prime Minister has said he will learn the lessons in the Commission's report and remains committed to building a fairer Britain. serve under your chairship, Mr Hosey. Um, can I begin by thanking the Petitions Committee for making the time um, for this important debate and the Honourable Member for Carshelton and Wellington for introducing this debate. I also like to thank the organisers of this petition 
as the Honourable mem Member mentioned, 130 people, 1,000 people signed it, including 470 people from my constituency. Um, I'd also like to thank all the Honourable Members that contributed this de to this debate. Um, the Honourable Member for Coatbridge, um, Kristen and Bilshaw, I hope I got that right, um, talked about structural racism and the impact that it has, particularly on society. Um, the Honourable Member for Romsey and Southampton North um, talked about how um, unless the um, um, reporting was made mandatory, it won't really happen. And um, talked about the work she's done on the Select Committee on how BAME individuals have been affected during the pandemic, um, which shows that there are issues in terms of inequalities. Um, and also the Honourable Member for Bath talked about the effectiveness of mandatory um, reporting, um, gender um, pay gap reporting, and how that's made a significant difference. Um, the last 18 months have brought a welcome focus on issues of race and ethnicity in this country and around the world. This is something that I'm also particularly passionate about. Um, and what we've seen, particularly in the context of the aftermath of the, of the murder of George Floyd and also the rise in the um, um, Black Lives Matter um, protests, we've seen this petition um, take off. I mention this because ethnicity pay disparities don't exist in isolation. Um, it does exist within broader um, structures of racism that affect black and Asian um, uh, minority people in every part of their lives. I've experienced it myself. I've previously called for the government to implement a race equality strategy and an action plan covering areas such as education, health and employment, because I really do feel that this would really address the structural inequalities that exist. I do believe that, you know, at the centre of this, there must be action to <coughs> tackle um, discrimination in the workplace and unequal access to training, finance and opportunities at the ethnicity pay gap. And this brings me to talk specifically about this petition. This petition calls for introduction of mandatory ethnicity gap um, pay reporting. And as the Minister will know, this is not a new suggestion or a new demand. Um, this is something that has been called on for some time. And I'll be very keen to hear from the Minister um, what proposals the government has to kind of address this. And as the Honourable Member mentioned earlier, the 2018 McGregor Mag Mag Smith review into workplace said that the government must legislate to make large businesses, large businesses publish their ethnicity data by salary band to show progress. Um, we all know that, you know, the government launched a consultation on this issue, which ran from October 2018 until January 2019. But I'm extremely concerned um, that we've yet to see anything published on this or any response to this consultation literally two years later. And I just really want to know from the Minister, what kind of message does that send to black and ethnic minority people in this country? To me, it comes across that the government doesn't particularly care about these individuals. The consultation has been done. Nothing has really kind of materialised from this. Um, I also want to talk about the issues that have been identified with mandatory reporting and how they, they come, how they can be overcome. I do feel that the delay is, 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 about, is not about practical, practicalities of introducing mandatory reporting, but instead um, I do feel the government has gone cold on this particular idea. And I do hope that the prolonged delay um, on this is, is this issue simply won't go away um, and that we can't settle for voluntary, uh, voluntary <coughs> reporting. And I hope the Minister hears loud and clear that voluntary um, reporting is totally inadequate. Just this week, and I'll tell you why, just this week it was reported that only 13 of the largest 100 employers in this country have published their ethnicity pay, pay gaps. This is similar to what the Honourable Member mentioned about um, before mandatory pay gap reporting was introduced in 2017. Prior to it becoming mandatory, a voluntary initiative led to only six companies publishing the gender pay gap data. Yet consultation shows that employees were generally supportive of mandatory um, reporting because it meant that organisations would essentially have consistent methods and be able to benchmark against each other. 
Um, in this case too, only mandatory ethnicity pay reporting will really deliver meaningful data from a wide range of businesses. And this echoes conversations mentioned by um, some of the honourable members about the fact that we need to get the data. Um, I do believe that businesses, the businesses themselves, um, a lot of businesses do back um, mandatory reporting from conversations that have been had. Um, CBI has joined the TUC and the Quality and Human Rights Commission to call on the government to go beyond the recommendation of the Commission on the race and disparities and bring in mandatory reporting without delay. Be happy to. Thank you. Um, the, my own friend will be aware that uh, without introducing mandatory ethnicity pay gap reporting, we don't truly know the full scale of the problem. We know that at the moment, um, I think people are saying it's about 2.3% in terms of a gap. Um, but when you actually look at individual groups with ethnicities, you've got 16% for Pakistani uh, groups and 8% for, for black groups. So does she agree that until this is made mandatory, not only will we not know the scale of the problem, but companies will not take steps forward to address these inequalities? Yeah, I completely agree with the comments that my honourable friend has mentioned. Unless we get mandatory um, reporting, um, we won't really know what the full, full scale of this issue is. And this has been shown by the fact that, you know, voluntary organisations, you know, given the opportunity to, to do the reporting, very little organisations have taken it up. And actually, it leads me to talk about, actually, I was going to discuss later on, about the stats, um, which have already been kind of collated, which is quite alarming. But we do need to have this done um, mandatory to be able to address the issues that are there <coughs> in terms of addressing the inequalities that exist. Um, I also wanted to point out that, you know, the Commission has stated, uh, I wanted to address the report that the Commission, um, the Human Rights Commission mentioned, which only called for voluntary reporting and some of the practical issues that the government have highlighted. The Commission stated that many employees around the country simply do not have enough ethnic minorities for recording a sample to be valid, and this is something that I've heard in this debate. But there are leading experts in these fields, including the Chartered um, Management Institution Institute and the Chartered Institute of Personal Development, who have actually set out practical ways to overcome this. Um, other concerns, such as the legal basis for collecting ethnicity information or low declaration ra rates, can simply be overcome through clear guidance from government. These practical issues are what the government have been working on over the last two years. So that their information is there for us to be able to do this rather than kicking this issue into the long grass. I also want to end by saying about why ethnicity pay gap reporting is so important. We know that at a national level, there are significant disparities exist between people of different ethnicities, as my honourable friend has mentioned. In 2019, the ONS found that the median hourly pay for white people was £12.49 £12 for black people it was £11.50, while for people of Pakistani origin, it was just £10.55. Um, the ONS study also found that people of Chinese origin earned an average of £15.38 an hour, and people of Indian or origin earned £14.43. This really should be caution um, to us about making sweeping statements about ethnic minorities as a whole. But there are clear evidence that people's race and ethnic back backgrounds determines how much they earn, and I've seen this firsthand. And sadly, for many people, um, the colour of your skin, along with gender and class, does determine the opportunities that are open for you. Um, and, the, and that is something that we really need to change. Um, and I also want to mention the interaction between race and other characteristics of gender. There was a recent report done by the Fawcett Society that found that ethnic minority women are most invisible from positions of power across public and private sectors in the UK. You know, we see it, you know, we see it around us. Um, um, we know that the range of connected factors do determine pay disparities such as age, location, and of course, gender and race. And it's precisely for these reasons we need to build up more data on these disparities, as my honourable friend for Strasser mentioned. Company-specific reporting is so important because it just obliges employees to examine their data and to work on why disparities might exist. 
It doesn't assume that discrimination takes place, but rather provides information so that employers can make informed decisions to improve recruitment, promotion and pay policies. Without it, we're not going to be able to see what progress has already been made and where there is more to do. To conclude, um, Mr Hosey, to fight discrimination, you must first see it and understand it. And I have to say the government has dragged its feet on this issue far too long. The consensus for mandatory ethnicity pay reporting is broad and the arguments for this are compelling. So when the minister does stand up, I'd be grateful if you could tell us, tell us what the government
anti-African culture that pervades the governmental behavior, especially at the police level structure in all non-African country, because all of them are engaged in stealing the wealth of Africa. My people of Africa, from every tribe, every And star. all of them are engaged in we using the brains of Africans in the diaspora. don't want them to come together to enjoy the wealth of Africa for themselves or to use those brains to build African institu institution and industry for themselves. And that does produce at the most local level and at the level of the white individual, hatred, and this, this attitude we call racism. And if you ask one of them to justify, say, well, why do you hate the Africans? Why do you have this racist view? You enslaved the Africans, but you are angry with them. They should be angry with you. You are the enslaver. You colonized me, but you're angry with me. I should be angry with you. It makes no logical sense except to justify the behavior of misusing the talent and the wealth and the resources of Africa to build Europe and European institutions across the world to sustain it and maintain it. That habit of behavior had become a culture, an anti-African culture. And it is that anti-African culture that we are calling racism. But racism is just one level of manifestation of the anti-African culture that pervades all Western and Asian and Middle Eastern capitals, all of them. And Africans need to stop pretending we only have one another. We only have the 54 nations in Africa, the diaspora in Europe, the Caribbean, Latin and English and French speaking Africans, and Brazil and Colombia and the other Spanish and Portuguese speaking African nations. That's who we have. We don't have any other friends culturally or intellectually or politically or militaristically anywhere else in the world. And so that gets manifested in America that if I see a black man, I don't have to say, excuse me, sir, um, your light on your car is broken or your license plate is missing. Do you have your driver's license? I walk up to the car and say that to a white man or a white woman. But when I walk up as a policeman to the car of a black man, I said, get out, get on the ground, hands in the air. And if you move too slow, you're a dead person. And we see it over and over, week after week, 